So thank you everybody for joining us. We are now on the internet. <laughs> um, so we really uh, wish we could meet physically uh, in person with everyone out there. Uh, we know that there's uh, an enthusiastic cannabis community in this state. Uh, we love that, it's very enriching. We've got some fantastic people uh, both in front of us that are part of the community and those we can't see. Uh, so thank you guys for joining us. Thanks for signing up. Uh, this is our first, uh, what we're calling uh, Craft First. It's our first ep episode of a kind of an online discussion series uh, where we will be, uh, hopefully with some degree of frequency, holding somewhat serious conversations, going over some uh, experiences and some uh, sharing some uh, uh, knowledge uh, and insights that all of us have from our different corners of, of the cannabis community. Uh, some professional, some casual. Uh, we'll explore different uh, topics, policy, agriculture. Uh, sometimes we'll have large panels, small panels. Um, this evening for our first episode, uh, we wanted to tackle some timely matters. Uh, and we uh, have entitled this uh, how a legal cannabis market can rebuild Vermont's economy after COVID-19. Uh, that's a lot of words. There's a lot of things to unpack. We hope to unpack that together over the next hour or so. Um, we will be taking some questions. Uh, so please, uh, those who are watching, uh, and thanks again for joining us, please feel free to use our question and answer uh, feature and then also our chat feature. Uh, this is all through Zoom. Um, so we've got lots of options for you guys to engage us uh, and communicate, not just with one another, but directly with us. Um, we do have some VGA staff with us before we get into the panelists. Uh, we do have Jennifer Dye, who called in. She's uh, our co-founder and director of operations. And we have uh, Bernie, whom you guys can see, and he's going to be co-hosting it with me. Uh, Bernie Silva is our education director. Uh, he has, um, pardon me. He has uh, some uh, professional experience that uh, he will share with you guys over the course of the evening. Um, I do want to start off with some introductions. I want to go into our panelists, but I just want to take a very brief moment, a very brief moment, and just kind of address what's been happening in our country, because a lot of shit's happened, and I, you know, I want to be respectful about that. Uh, don't want to spend too much time on it, but, you know, I do want to recognize that, you know, there's somewhat of an uprising happening in our country. Um, <laughs> You know, it's surrounding police violence and, and the African American community. Um, and just to fold it back in, uh, as we all know, everyone that's watching, everyone that's participated in this plant in any, in any facet, um, cannabis is very much the intersection of many, many things um, health and wellness, business, farming, the environment, um, racial, social, uh, criminal justice, many things. Um, and uh, it would be remiss if we didn't recognize that prohibition historically has been racially, uh, 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 you know, const constructed, uh, especially in this country, but every other country as well. Um, and we just want to say very briefly that um, our organization condemns police violence across the country. Um, we support the efforts of uh, Black Lives Matter and the Zero Project in police reform nationwide. Uh, and I just want to point you guys to some social media posts that we've had uh, over the past couple of days. There is a petition going around. Um, so we ask you guys to act. It takes a second to put your name on the petition. Uh, we think it's reasonable nationwide police reform. Uh, visit Instagram, our Twitter page and whatnot. And we'll get it on our website as well. Um, so that's all I wanted to say. Uh, I just wanted to take a moment and thank you guys for, for bearing with me. Um, all right. So uh, I do want to get into it. And before we start our panel discussion, um, I do want to introduce the panelists themselves. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, so we do have uh, some uh, fantastic small business owners, uh, some retailers, and some uh, farmers. Uh, and and, and uh, you know, however they, else they wish to label themselves, but some genuinely nice people. You guys are familiar with a lot of these people, but I want them to take a moment to introduce themselves. Uh, that's really important for the Vermont Growers Association as a trade association. Um, it's important for us to highlight the uh, fine businesses of our emerging cannabis community. Um, so I do want to start with uh, Greg Newman. We have uh, 
Mr. Newman is the uh, owner of Emerald Rose in Bristol, Vermont. Uh, and uh, uh, Greg, um, as you introduce yourself, um, why, don't you, uh, why don't we start with what you do now um, and why you're interested in working professionally in the cannabis space um, and, and why Vermont? Well, uh, Greg Newman, Emerald Rose, grows in Bristol. Um, I, I, I'm interested in, in this profession because it's becoming a legitimate profession. And I want to foster that entrepreneurial spirit and in a legitimate manner so that, you know, people that choose this industry aren't labeled as something other. You know, we're going through this <clears throat> moment in our time where, you know, the other is it's us against them or not one of us, you're one of them. And uh, we're all one, you know? So instead of being labeled as this, I'd like to have a, a say in trying to bring the conversation forward, you know? And uh, as far as, aside from my garden shop, I'd like to offer when the, when the, when the laws change um, to sell cuttings and clones you know, and, and live plants, which you can't do right now. So that's kind of where I'm at, you know. And just for those who maybe aren't too familiar with you, um, just maybe just spend like a second talking about how people can find your business, uh, uh, maybe online as well. Uh, and, 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 you know, are you guys just uh, um, seed or grow shop or? Uh, yeah, we're, we're basically a grow shop. We do have a, 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 a hemp seed website at Emerald Rose Seeds dot com and we have our facebook presence at emerald rose grows on facebook and uh yeah we're open six days a week tuesdays through saturdays uh and open by appointment whenever you want fantastic thank yeah. you so much for joining us today really appreciate yeah. it um i want to move over to uh kismet so megan and sean uh thank you guys for joining us uh these got these guys uh, may be familiar to some. Uh, they've got a fantastic flower uh, business that uh, we all see on Instagram, but I'll let you guys take it from there. Um, so, uh, you know, what do you guys do now? Expand on that. And then also, uh, what is your interest? Uh, what, what is, uh, what do you, you know, what do you guys plan to do in the, professionally in the cannabis space? Well, hi. <laughs> thanks for having us. Uh, yeah, we're Kismet Farm in Rochester. We're small operation and we specialize in cut flowers and certified organic hemp. Um, we've been cannabis enthusiasts for a long time. Um, moved here from California, uh, got into the hemp industry once it became legal and have been trying to perfect our craft. And like Mr. Newman had said, we're looking to start a legitimate, um, get into the legitimate rec market and um, provide the rural economies of Vermont a chance uh, for farmers to sell local products like we're doing now. So just as I see hemp being sold locally in our community that's tested and safe, we'd like to see the same thing happen here in Vermont. Yeah, I, um, I grow the flowers and I also love combining the hemp with the flowers to kind of bring that plant out of the closet and into our homes. And um, I'm happy that we're in a spot in this right now in Vermont. Um, where this is an opportunity that is is coming and we definitely want to be a part of it. We've been here for 15 years and we love Vermont and aren't going anywhere. And we re really just want to see the industry move in the right direction, having had dispensary experience and seeing what's happening. Um, I really want us to make sure Vermont makes the right decisions moving forward. And do you guys currently uh, sell directly from your farm or do you uh, go to farmers markets? Yeah. Where can mo people mostly find you? Um, you can find us at our website, kismetfarmvermont.com. Um, we have Instagram and Facebook. Um, you can find us at the Rochester Farmer's Market selling flowers on Fridays, 3 to 6. And we sell through our website as well. And, and, and Instagram connection as well. Yep. Awesome. Thanks so much for joining us, guys. And yep. thanks for being outside. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone, everyone's inside. All right, let's move over to uh, This is Family Tree. So we've got... Uh, we've got Jane Lanza with us. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, Jane is one of the, the part owner of This Is Family Tree, uh, and I will let her take it over. Um, 
So again, we're just asking everyone, uh, for the most part, um, what you do now, and then why you're sort of generally interested in working in cannabis professionally, uh, and why Vermont. Thank you, first of all, Jeffrey, for putting this together, and to each of you, panelists and contributors and entrepreneurs and farmers and senators who um, are part of this community that uh, we share. And I'd like to thank you, Jeffrey, for acknowledging the state of the world right now that we're a part of as individuals and as this community and um, express a moment of gratitude for the privilege to be a part of this conversation and to live in this peaceful place, both with regard to um, COVID response and management and then also with regard to um, peaceful protest. So I, um, I just feel so privileged to live in this place where I had the good fortune of spending most of my childhood, as did my husband. So we're, we're Vermonters by growth and consciously choose like others to raise our family here. Family Tree is also about reducing stigma and bringing um, awareness through cannabis to people, but we also grow other things on our land. Our business is just hemp. Um, ben and I each have our own background in history with hemp and um, he has a background in manufacturing and engineering and I do um, healing retreats and marketing. So we've come together and use our children to um, further our lifelong love of this healing plant. I um, am certified in cannabis medicine through the University of Vermont and that um, inspires me to learn more about cannabis applications to specific ways of healing and the various compounds in the plant. Um, we have a website, so we're kind of 24 seven with shipment within a couple days. And we are hoping um, to continue to work with local retailers in the future to distribute that product as well. So thank you for the opportunity. And you can learn about us at thisisfamilytree.com or on Instagram at thisisfamilytree. Um, and we're Family Tree Hemp Co. on Facebook. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Thanks for joining us. Um, fantastic. So let's move over to the Rogers. Uh, we've got um, John F. and Senator Rogers with us. Uh, thank you guys very much for joining us. Uh, Lots of familiar faces across this uh, panel. Uh, so these individuals, uh, the two Johns, are uh, the uh, family owners of the Vermont, Farm, Vermont Farmers Hemp Company. I apologize. And you guys are located out of West Glover. Uh, so take it from there. Yeah, so uh, my wife and I just purchased last fall the farm that I grew up on that's been in our family uh, since the early 1800s. And um, son John here is an integral part of all things hemp. Uh, this is our fourth year growing hemp. And we also make our own products. We make all our own solves, uh, topicals in-house, and then have our um, tinctures made at a local processor. We are in several local stores and chiropractor's offices. And in the last couple uh, two or three months have been in uh, Kinney Drug Stores, which has about 100 outlets around Vermont and New York. Um, we're looking to grow and hoping eventually that the farm will uh, provide enough income so that John can get done his engineering job and I can uh, quit my construction and snow plowing and all the other things that I do uh, to try to create enough cash flow to uh, prop up my uh, farming habit. And in my spare time, I'm a Vermont State Senator and have actually written all of the hemp legislation uh, that's passed through the building in the last several years to keep us in federal compliance and keep Vermont as a leader in the hemp industry. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, yeah. Go ahead, John. Go ahead. I am uh, John F., uh, part two uh, of the business. I was approached um, by my father in the, what, what it been, would have been fall of 2017 after he grew his first small hemp crop. And he said, this was fun. Do you want to grow some hemp with me next year? And I said, you know, that 
it's kind of sounds like a fun little thing to try. So um, yeah, I, I run our uh, website, which is um, vermontfarmershempco.com. Uh, I also run our Instagram page, which is at Vermont Farmers Hemp Co. And uh, we are on Facebook, Vermont Farmers Hemp Company as well. So I'm kind of the, uh, the PR guy and I'm the tractor guy. He's the computer guy. <laughs> I try to get on the track. <laughs> well, uh, thank you very much, guys, for joining us. And uh, I know I speak for everyone when I say thank you, uh, Senator, for your work. Uh, and I do uh, what stuck out. Uh, keep Vermont uh, a leader in the hemp industry. So we may touch upon that uh, in, in a moment. Uh, thank you, guys. Uh, sincerely, I really appreciate it. Uh, last but certainly not least, uh, a friend of ours uh, and uh, a beloved figure of the community, uh, not just his shop, but himself. Uh, we have uh, Scott Sparks uh, has joined us, uh, Vermont Hippocurian. Um, thank you very much, uh, Scott, for joining us. Um, and uh, well, uh, he, uh, I'll, I'll let you take it. Uh, um, uh, what, why, what do you do now for those maybe who aren't familiar? Uh, but also, um, what interests you about working professionally in the cannabis space and why Vermont? Well, I guess I'll start at the beginning. I was in food service for 45 years. In the last 10 years, I worked for a local company as the VP of sales. We brought uh, we farm to table kind of stuff. I'll leave the name out right now. But I worked a lot with local farmers and producers bringing their products to market. That company was bought by a multi-billion dollar corporation that had previously bought the Vermont company that I worked for. I had been down that road once before. I couldn't stand it, and that's why I was working for another Vermont company. Um, then when they got bought, I just needed an exit plan. Um, they gave me one, I, and uh, one day I was sitting next to a coworker, and I just said, you know, I think I'm going to open a hemp shop. That day, I got a spam email on my work email inviting me to the uh, Northern Colorado Hemp Expo. I decided that was a message. I took the message. I bought myself VIP tickets and first class plane tickets. I went to Colorado. Um, this was in 2017 in April um, then, and I didn't know what to expect. I wanted to see what this was all about. I was blown away by what I saw, came back and started my plan, left my job, jumped off a cliff. It was a real risk. Um, <laughs> and I opened my store almost a year to the day um, from going to the Hemp Expo. So that was in April 2nd, 2018 is when I opened. I didn't really have a model to go on. I, I just kind of decided, well, I'll try this, I'll try that. Um, certainly made some errors. Um, when I first opened, there were so few Vermont hemp people that I could buy from. I couldn't even fill my two cabinets up. I had to put rocks in the cabinets to fill up space. Well, that changed fast, as you all know. Um, I, my primary thing I do here is I, I try to connect farmers to the little bottles and other things I have on my shelf so that people understand that they're helping keeping Vermont um, land open, helping support local farms, etc. I sell all the tinctures and salves and all that stuff. Um, I also sell quite a bit of flour. When I first opened, I brought in hemp, rope, and paper, um, thinking I could get people interested in the whole plant. I was definitely wrong about that. I, mean, <laughs> um, I think someday maybe they will, but instead, what I, I took, I got rid of that and. I, I put in grow supplies and kind of like the convenience store grow supplies. You can pretty much get everything you want. I just don't have tons of it here, but we order things for people and that part of my business is growing. Um, to uh, answer the question about like, uh, how can the economy um, get better uh, through COVID and how can hemp and cannabis help? I'm five miles from Massachusetts. I get it, even on the slowest day of the week, I get between calls and personal visits about 10 people looking for cannabis, even though they can buy it in Massachusetts, the perception is that Vermont will have better quality. And it's, it's really sad that I have to tell them no. Um, and some days it's way more than that, especially, you know, tourist weekends. So I would love to eventually be able to 
um, as you might have a, a, a local cheese shop or a craft beer or wines or anything like that, I would like to be able to sell that. I don't want to sell a Coke and Pepsi of cannabis, but I would do a separate location probably doing the legal cannabis in them. So I have my retail store at 8 Flat Street in Brattleboro. And then I have Facebook and Instagram. And I guess that's how you find me. I have an online store. I do quite a bit of business. I was going to say you guys do online sales. I do a lot of online sales. Yeah, and especially through the virus. My street sales dropped 50%. My online sales increased 250%. So, wow. Yeah. Wow. I put a lot of marketing effort and spend money on SEO and stuff like that. Well, you just mentioned something uh, that I actually want to pick up on. Um, thank you, Scott. Uh, thank you again, everybody else for joining us. Um, I really, really appreciate it. Um, hopefully those who uh, are watching, and I just want to take a moment and say, uh, we will put this on our YouTube page uh, along with future uh, Craft First episodes. Uh, so uh, we will let you guys know when this is available, won't be immediately, but uh, we'll work with the panelists and also those watching. So hopefully this becomes a resource for everyone. Um, especially people in Montpelier. Uh, so, you know, what are we talking about? We're talking about a craft cannabis market in Vermont, uh, and we have some of its uh, local stakeholders with us uh, this evening. Um, so I want to talk about uh, what that market looks like to you guys, uh, and also what Scott touched upon, how uh, we can use that to uh, rebuild uh, our economy and restore jobs. Um, one thing that I like to point out, uh, as many of us know, Vermont, you know, is the leader in small businesses nationwide. Uh, per capita, we have more small businesses than any other state in the country. Uh, so really, that is the foundation, along with uh, craft uh, industries in general, uh, the cottage industry model, uh, and tourism. Um, and so with all of that in mind, uh, you know, let's talk about, uh, I'd like to hear from you guys uh, maybe less than what we spent with introductions, maybe 60 seconds. Uh, when you guys think of uh, a legal craft market in Vermont for cannabis, um, uh, what do you think of? Uh, do you think of something that you see now? Do you think of something that is in the future? Um, Greg, uh, is it uh, something that you're familiar with? Is it something that you, you wish to see? How would you describe if you if you could envision a craft marketplace for Vermont? Just, uh, just, just a couple I, sentences. Yeah, I, I'd like to see like farm farm to to customers sales. You know that that would be a big thing. <clears throat> Basically, like to get the legislature and the powers that be to realize that there are other business models in the equation in the universe other than a brick and mortar store that you could walk in buy your cannabis product and walk out. You know, there's there's a lot of other business models out there besides that one that it seems that we're locked into. And I think that Vermont could be a leader in defining what other business models are applicable and possible. Fantastic, so I, I will say that, you know, one of the things we, we often hear, and I wanna open this up to everyone, uh, in Montpelier uh, over the past couple months is, um, basically that, uh, you know, local farmers and local retailers aren't quite ready uh, to uh, uh, develop or uh, they're not ready to open up in time uh, for a craft marketplace. Um, that's small businesses, everything from farmers to retailers. Uh, and we often hear that sometimes, uh, you know, uh, the dispensaries or other businesses need to uh, be the first ones to develop that marketplace for us. So as we individually describe what the marketplace doing, is already there, we just need to tap into it. Absolutely, absolutely. So uh, I think you know as we go around and describe what we what we see as uh, ourselves as a Vermont uh, craft marketplace, um, are you guys ready? Do you guys are, are you do you do you agree with that with that statement that? Um, local farmers and retailers uh, need more time? Or are you guys ready now when you think of what's needed for, for uh, a craft marketplace? What about the Rogers? Um, now, I'm not asking, are you guys going to be getting into the cannabis business immediately? But what would you need? Uh, and, what, and, how, and what would that market look like? Well, I think there's huge potential. And I think if you 
they flipped a switch and it was legal tomorrow that there are farmers that would have seed in the ground and have beautiful product ready by fall. And if, like Greg mentioned, if they could actually sell it at farmers markets and at the farm, um, it would be generating a huge amount of revenue right off because um, there's, there's just huge potential for it. And um, as Scott said, tons of folks coming from Massachusetts and other states who want to visit Vermont would also be apt to go uh, to an area where there were craft farms and maybe stay for the week and tour different farms. And we always preach to everybody in, in the hemp world, know your farmer, visit the farm, so you know how the product is being produced. Yeah, I agree. Completely agree. Yeah, I totally agree too. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, 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 Sean and Megan, are you guys currently, uh, would you consider yourselves like a destination uh, farm? Can people come and visit you guys? Or how do you see that working out also in the in the cannabis space? And also, do you guys feel like uh, yourselves or other local farmers uh, are ready now for a commercial market? Or do you guys need more time to set up? I think we're, I think we would be ready. I think we're in a great spot for it. We're along Route 100. We have a lot of tourists that come through and we're an economically challenged town. We need all the revenue that we can provide for our town. And we would love to be a destination farm where people would come up and see the farm and experience and, um, and be able to get craft cannabis from us. Yeah, like John and Senator Rogers mentioned, if you guys are out in West Glover, um, and we're out here in Rochester, we can't have there be five retail markets in the state of Vermont. Right. Like, it, that just can't happen. Like we need the people yeah. that want to have the Vermont experience and spend some time in our small towns, have a stop on their trip to, to, to try the local flavors of the town. We're seeing local breweries popping up everywhere. I don't see how craft cannabis doesn't play a role there. Uh, and, and what about our retailers? Uh, do you guys feel like from your vantage point, uh, where, how you operate in, in this uh, marketplace, uh, are you guys ready? Is the retail community, are the small businesses and family businesses ready to uh, uh, engage uh, this uh, commercial market? Or, or is it something that you guys feel like you may need more time with to... to if, if, if I was allowed to sell starts and clones, I could do it tomorrow. I could, I could put a big old tent in my, which I have in my shop, and I could put a sign on the window because I get tons of people, especially this time of year, coming in and asking me for cuts and clones, and I can't sell it to them. You know, it's, it's that would be my personal niche. I don't want to be a dispensary and sell products, but I would sell, you know, cuttings and plants and stuff, and I get people asking me all the time. So I would like to do that, and I would be ready tomorrow to do that. My concerns or my issues would be, number one, getting the town to opt in, because my current understanding of the bills out there is the town has to opt in first. Mm, I find that challenging, um, but that would be the first thing. And then I, my store happens to be across from the Boys and Girls Club. That'll never fly, so I have to find a separate location to... Uh, sell cannabis if not move both my businesses there a, and then financially you know how much money are the licenses going to cost and the cost of setting up a new business so that would be my concerns um senator rogers was your version of s54 did it have an opt-out or an opt-in i tried to get the opt-out but i got overruled and i think the last i knew it was the opt-in okay because we were we were discussing it, we were weren't a hundred percent sure if one if the Senate version was an opt out and the House version was an opt in, and if that had to was one of the things that had to be consolidated. Well, uh, th that very well could be. We've passed the bill so many times in the Senate. Um, I can't remember what all the House did to it, but um, it, it would definitely be, be better for towns to opt out. I I find it ridiculous for every single person who wants to start a business in their town to have to go before the town to, to convince them to opt in. It just, it doesn't make any sense. No other businesses have to do that. Yeah, it's, it's inhibiting a business. It's inhibiting the creation yeah. of business. Yeah. Well, no, I mean, from, from one standpoint, it's 
you're forcing the towns to create a law to do business <laughs> as opposed to deciding no. Yeah. Right. Right. It, and that's that's and that's what's problematic because you're asking uh, small local uh, people running the local government who already are busy with whatever they're doing to do Very. more work, which they're probably not willing to do. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah as a yeah. follow up to, to what we were talking about in terms of having an industry where it's five large corporation or corporate stores or five retail locations only versus potentially having unlimited or several retailers that are represented by small businesses, which do you guys think would be more beneficial in terms of state revenues and tax collection for the state of Vermont in the first year? Having just five stores that can operate and in that unlimited sense, five stores that already exist in Massachusetts and Maine and, other board, and New York and other bordering states, or having Vermont industry and Vermont businesses owned by Vermont small business owners. Which do you think would generate more revenue in that first year? Which is that, you know, the talk out of Montpelier is the fear that there's not enough money to start up regulation. I, so I everything, everything is designed to recoup as much money as they can. That's why these dispensaries are paying 35,000 35, per? Or is yeah, it seven, so yeah. 175,000 total uh, is- Between the, the five, uh, yeah. The check. Yep. <laughs> Exactly. So, which which do you think would recover that money more quickly? If if the Vermont businesses were honest, I think they would re recover more money quicker because a large section of the population, the customer base, they don't want to go to a dispensary because right. they already have their outlets and right. they don't have to pay the, you know, the extreme prices and get, you know, different quality and so forth. So, by by limiting to just the five, you would be limiting the entire revenue, you know, a uh, uh, possibility. You know, why yeah. why not open it up to everybody and say, hey, everybody, get it wherever is a legitimate registered business, and then you have a bunch of businesses rather than five. So follow up. Yeah, and as Sean, go ahead, go ahead. If yeah. I could put in for just a second, as Sean pointed out. It's also going to send all the people to whatever five communities get it, and all our little towns are going to be left yeah. out. And what what I've been shooting for <clears throat> is to try to help the, the small farmer, and we want to help the small communities. And that's why I, I keep pointing out that if there was the ability for farmers to sell, um, you know, it would be just like the local breweries. I've seen people at Hill Farmstead Brewery, which is in our neighborhood. Uh, drive up from New Jersey for a day beer trip or, or Massachusetts for a couple days and they go to three or four different breweries and they're dropping money in every one of those towns. They're staying overnight, they're stopping at the restaurant, they're stopping at the general store. That's what's going to create real money, not a beeline to a dispensary and go somewhere else. We want the whole community to benefit. Yep. And it also empowers the farmer, or in this case, the brewer, because we all know that Sean Hill, I believe is his name, has become a world-renowned brewer. Yep. And people from all over the world are traveling to Vermont just for that beer. Whereas if he were initially told, you may only dispense your beer through one of five pre-approved locations, he may have not made the effort, yep. which is why people drive all the way to the middle of nowhere to taste his beer. Right. So that really does allow people all over the state, as you're saying, to truly um, epitomize what makes Vermont so historically unique and um, so many small businesses and so um, still preserve, you know, quaint. <laughs> so, so uh, um, go, go, go ahead, Greg. Oh, so, no, the quaintness of it all is, is part of the whole grown in Vermont, our brand. That's part of the whole equation, you know? Um, Senator yeah. Rogers, you had mentioned that, um, you know, you're trying to keep Vermont a leader in the hemp industry. That, and th by that you mean on a national scale, right? Oh, absolutely. Um, you, as everybody knows, um, just as Scott was saying, people come from Massachusetts where it's legal looking for Vermont cannabis. Vermont has a name recognized for quality in, in food, in in manufactured goods, clothing, whatever. We produce a ton of quality stuff. And uh, export those goods. And we export those goods, which is good for Vermont because there's, you know, 600,000 people and not enough money 
to just sell to Vermonters. We need folks from uh, New York and New Jersey and Connecticut and Massachusetts and everywhere else coming here to visit our farms and buying our product and taking it back home and telling their friends how great the product is and how great their trip was and, and that they had a wonderful time visiting the farms because I really think this has also got huge potential for uh, tourism in uh, places like California. They have campus friendly wedding venues and, yeah. and party venues and that kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, some brides and grooms want to be able to have their wedding pictures in a big giant field of hemp, even though it's not uh, marijuana, it's, it's, it's still, it, it, it's going to be a huge draw if we can just get over this hump. Yep. So, so my, my lead up was, you know, every year it seems like federally we're getting closer to federal legislation to legalize marijuana or decriminalize it in a sense and kind of open up uh, business between borders. When we're looking at a, a you know, a, a regulatory body like S54 versus something that opens up business for a majority of Vermonters, which ones do you think, do you guys think sets up Vermont like better sets up Vermont in the long run for doing business nationally. Let's bring that over to uh, maybe Kismet. He has some, uh, right, Sean, you guys have some uh, experience with other states growing in. Um, well, be, well, we, you know, we understand that there's just a flood of CBD in Vermont. So we've tried hard to find other outlets. Um, you know, people want the Vermont brand. We understand that. Um, we don't have enough material. We don't have enough hemp to, to really get into a large out-of-state market. Um, but I, people want the brand. People want the Vermont brand, and we understand the strength of that. Um, and we'd like to grow it here. We'd like to grow it that over time, both with hemp and, if we can, in the rec market. Uh, Bernie, do you have a follow-up? I mean, speaking to the Vermont brand, um, you know, specifically, what's what's the best way to get there? It seems like we're hearing that, you know, uh, allowing uh, those of us around this uh, Zoom room uh, to participate really is the fabric of that Vermont brand. Is that also true with retailers? Do we need those craft retailers to have a craft market as well? Yeah. Yeah. It, like Like Scott says, he connects the the product with the farm. And that is the Vermont brand, you know, that that's, that's what we all try to do and achieve as, as branding our products and our farm and then offering them directly to the public. And if we, and you know, you tap into that tourism thing back in the seventies, you know, like seventies, there was what was called the, the ski highway was route 100. And it went from the bottom of the state all the way up to Jay Peak, and people would come for a week or a couple of days and hit every ski hill along the way, you know. And now it's the now it's the the craft breweries and the ski hills. And tomorrow it's going to be the hemp fields and cannabis fields, craft breweries and ski hills. And it, it just brings more people in and it exposes them to the the Vermont brand and what we stand for and how much they're going to miss us when they go back to the city. I can tell you, my customers, uh, the out-of-state ones particularly, they are interested in going to visit hemp farms now. I don't have anyone anywhere I can send them. In my store, I go visit the farmers that I do business with and take photos. And I have a slideshow that plays on a big TV screen in my store. So they can see that. And then that makes them want to go even more. And so there's definitely a market for that. And I, I think someone should come up with a hemp maze, like they have corn mazes, oh, that that so, um, <laughs> for sure. So I, yeah, this, people are absolutely interested because as you all know, it's really cool to walk out in a field of hemp or cannabis of any kind yeah. and uh, just be able to do that. And you can't do that where most of these people live. Yeah, last year we had a field that had about 2,008 to 10 foot hemp plants in it and you could it was literally like being in the forest mm -hmm. and everybody that went there and saw them it just blew their mind so i'd be happy to chat with you scott and we sure. would uh, we would 
be happy to get our products down there, but also give you a place to, to send folks who want to come. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> a long distance. Fantastic. <laughs> I was going to say, we would also love to host visitors by appointment and share what we do. Transparency is mm -hmm. very important to us. We're a small craft family operation with our children involved in our, our, our every aspect of it. So people would understand that probably before mm -hmm. they came. Um, but we are proud to, you know, share this little corner of Northwestern Vermont and some of the interesting parts of this family property um, that go into the outdoor hemp. We also grow hemp. Um, year-round indoor to have fresh flower available. We're particularly interested in craft flower. And, um, so I have a question about S54. Doesn't it currently state that if you are a farmer that you can also apply for a processor and a, a selling license? So if there are five stores, couldn't the farmer also be selling in the way we're describing and then, or not? Um, so there's, <clears throat> Uh, there's the dispensaries are going to have one license that allows them to do everything in unlimited um, quantities. So they have an unlimited cultivation space and unlimited square footage. They can have unlimited employees. They can have as large of an extraction facility, as big of a store, whatever they want. As far as it goes for the, for everyone else, Basically, what there's no, there's no uh, parallel integration. So you can have one cultivation license, one retail store, and one extraction license for one facility. And one person can own all three things, but they can't own more than one of those three things, um, which is also a, a good program. I mean, I'm not, that's not, you know, I, I, it's, it's up to opinion. I just wanted to be clear about how that would work. Like as it stands now, I'm not in support of the bill necessarily. I just wanted to be really clear on, I thought for some reason that we would still be able to operate as we are with hemp if we went with a similar program by flipping the switch as it's been said. Um, so, I guess it depends who manages it and what, you know, the license creators come up with. Let's go into that a little bit. There's, um, there's like a scheduling, like the, the way that the licensing rollout is designed was kind of what I wanted to touch on next. So that was a good lead up. Okay. Basically, um, that, that's what they anticipate the licensing structure to be. However, at initial rollout, um, only the five dispensaries will be able to operate um, as cultivators, retailers and processors. And the idea is that the small craft 1,000 square foot cultivators license will be released at the same time. Um, then five or six months later, there should be, they'll begin accepting license application for retailers. So considering that information, considering that if the law passes in September, and then we're talking about licensing rollout in April, 2022, um, those dispensaries, they can choose their buildings, they can do everything they want now, so that in April 2022, when their license becomes active, they can immediately start selling. Whereas someone like Scott, who talked about zoning issues that he's going to have, he would first have to attain that licensing before going out looking for the spaces to guarantee everything. I mean, and right. so that six month difference actually turns into a year, maybe two as you're awaiting for your licensing to come in and looking for your space and dealing with town zoning. So considering that information, um, just considering this retail side like Scott, and um, <clears throat> how, how do you think that would impact your business? How do you think that would impact your ability to participate in this industry? Well, it would be challenging because right in Brattleboro, I have one of these dispensaries. And so I would have that direct competition get a start on me. Not that I, I mean, I feel I could compete very well, but it would take me a while to get there. And they would have that running start and um, get a lot of people in the habit of going there. Um, you know, it's already a challenge enough because they sell some of the same products I sell and they have a, uh, a louder voice sometimes because of their Burlington presence um, and their presence in the legislature and lobbying and things like that. But I've been able to, you know, create my own, my own space here and have a legitimate business that, you know, supports me and my employees. And um, so I think it's possible, but it's going to be challenging. 
Mm -hmm. And then on the cultivator side, you know, that, that cultivator license is going to be given out, but those cultivators will not be able to sell farm to farm to client, farm to patient. And they're expected to sell their pro wholesale their product to the dispensary stores, which will then resell it. Cultivators, I'm curious how you think that's going to affect your business, your bottom line, your ability to, to get your product out there and your ability to get your brand out there. How do you anticipate that? For, how do you anticipate that from shaking out? Sean, do you want to go? Can ahead? I comment? Can yep. I comment on that? Um, I I'm very, I feel very strongly about this topic. Um, my fear is that they're going to let craft growers do their thing and that it will be, have to be wholesaled to the dispensaries. Right. But my, but what's going to happen in reality is they're going to say, sorry, Sean and Megan, great product, but we have enough because they have multi-million dollar facilities that are ready to go. They have bays that are ready to crank product. So unlimited be, canopies. Yes, there's going to be yeah. an illusion, an illusion of them wanting to buy. But I don't think it will happen. Can I, I agree. Ask well said. Go ahead, Megan. Um, why is the state pushing for uh, for the dispensaries to have a year out? Why can't we all start? <laughs> you know, why? Well, I don't understand why they wouldn't allow small farmers to um, to just I go the same. Well, same I can't answer rat. this like definitively. Yeah, it just seems like crazy <laughs> yeah, to me. Yeah. I, so I can't answer it definitively, but basically, um, Montpelier has been taught or brainwashed into thinking that our state government will never be able to take a program off with our general fund with funding that already exists, and that they require an initial influx of money to hire people to regulate and do that work. And You're so the dispensaries, well, that's, that's so, so, so it's a two prong attempt from proponents of S64. They're saying that the Department of Agriculture is not prepared and not legally capable of doing it. You need the cannabis commission that they're pushing, which, are, which appoints positions that are easily uh, lobbied for. And then, and then on, on the third end, they're trying to say that there's no money to get this started. So the only way they can get it started is if they accept this $35,000 license from each dispensary right. as initial startup money. And in return for paying such an exorbitant amount for licensing, they get this head start, which they less than tried to make it a year more. Oh, previously, at first they tried to make it so that they would be the only licensees. Then they yep. said a two year head start. Then they said a one year head start. And now it's five months. <laughs> let's, bring it, let's, let's bring it over to the and, APC and, of Ag. Um, oh, go, Greg, go ahead. No, and in the, in the meantime, you know, there's still going to be the only outlet, you know? Right, right. Yeah, no, it's... it's, it's, it's uh, like even, even after the five months and they pay all this and, you know, we have our... T there's still going to be the only... The five outlets in the whole state, you know? It, it's ridiculous. It takes well, money to make money, but it also takes some guts. Go ahead, Joe. Yeah, I'll put a yeah, so the, the other thing, back to what Sean was talking about, you know, they they may buy some craft stuff from farmers, but what are they going to try to sell to their customers? Are they going to try to sell yours and my stuff, or are they going to try to sell their own stuff? Of course, they're going to try to push their own stuff first. They're making more money on it. So they're going to undercut the farmer. And once again, it's going to be like milking cows. Farmers yep. aren't going to get oh, yeah. paid what they what should get paid and the dispensaries are going to make more money off the farmer's hard work than the farmer is. It's, it's horrible. Uh, I want to jump into the agency of ag, but just to cap this section, which I think th thought was fantastic. Lots of uh, shared insights. Thank you. One last when thing. I, One yeah. last thing. I'm sorry to interrupt, no. but you know, in doing all it saying, Hey, everybody, you know, who wants to can apply, but not, allowing a realized large enough market all they're going to do is empower the black or the gray market right now now you'll get mm -hmm. a bunch of people that are registered legitimate farmers and right, they're going right, to right. a whole bunch of stuff and then they're going to be like oh i can't really sell it to these guys so i guess i'm going to sell it to those guys and and that's one of the <laughs> statements that we hear often when we talk really? to people in montpelier and not everyone but a lot of people is we want to 
transition people into uh, the legal market. And we think what we're describing right. seems to be the best way possible because if you don't provide people that outlet but allow them to grow, you may be accidentally expanding your legacy market. We don't like to say black market, your legacy market, underground market. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so that, that's, they may be getting the opposite of what they're asking or what they're saying. It's, but I have to say that that yeah. statement in itself is ironic because aren't they saying that Vermonters can't meet the demand anyway, the farmers? So you're saying we can't meet the demand. Oh, wait a minute. No, you have too much now. There's just, that doesn't well, that's, make sense. That's, that's basically they're trying to justify this system by saying that they will never meet the demand that Vermonters have for this because 80,000 Vermonters smoke. Honestly, I think the number is higher. But the reality is that in, that in those six months, in that time, they can do whatever they can to fill that void, kind of eliminating any possibilities for anyone else. And then going back to discussing about the prices, you know, what's to stop them from overpricing a Kismet Farms ounce, basically pricing it out? Making it unaffordable so that people buy everything. And then it doesn't, if someone pays $400 for that ounce, it doesn't matter because they're making a fortune off of it. Yeah. it so it sounds like um, with a model that would be, um, you know, constructed with S54, we may see some uh, lost, uh, uh, some, some revenue uh, not captured, not fully captured by that market. Um, and not only that, but the, some of the uh, capital that's not being captured are of the small businesses and those that make up the fabric of the Vermont brand. Um, and so uh, I do, uh, do want to be mindful of time. We're uh, approaching, we're just past 7.55 on my end. I do want to bring up the agency of ag. We often hear this being talked about in Montpelier as well. So we want to open this up to you guys briefly. Um, we think that you guys may have some experience with uh, the Vermont Agency of Agriculture uh, Farms and Markets. Um, we often hear in Montpelier that that agency is not prepared, not capable of running a cannabis market, a legal cannabis market. Um, we just want to ask people that uh, those in, uh, individuals, business owners that have uh, an experience, that have maybe a, a relationship with the agency, what you guys think. Uh, do you have... Uh, maybe some positive takeaways of your uh, experience with the agency, maybe some critiques as well, and how you think they would be in terms of um, overseeing licensing uh, for the state of Vermont, as we see in many other states. Uh, for instance, the state of Illinois uses pre-existing state agencies. It's uh, somewhat of a commonplace. We would not be inventing the wheel here. Can we use our pre-existing state agencies as well? Um, uh, I do know that we have some farmers, maybe Jane, I know that uh, they just opened up indoor, which is uh, similar to uh, what we're talking about with THC. Uh, you guys indoor farm, how was that experience with registering with the Agency of Ag? Well, as I mentioned, we're pretty tiny. So we're permitted up to 500 pounds outdoors and that costs $100 and it was $25 prior last year. So really anybody could grow hemp that was interested in it from a hobbyist level to a commercial level, even very small. And then I think, I don't know what the next level is, but it's only a $500 permit. But there's a tier that makes sense proportional to the number of plants. For indoor, there's no such tiering system. So if you wanna cultivate indoor craft flower, um, you pay the same as somebody who's making, you know, 100 times that doing seeds or something in a small indoor space. So we paid $1,000 for an indoor hemp permit this year, which was nearly cost prohibitive to proceed in that direction, but we believe in it so much and are also open to exploring how this could all work um, in an adult use market as well. So we proceeded with that um, decision and the agency was very clear about walking me through the bill and where it said that. And I still just kept sending an email, but it says, if you exclusively grow indoor, it's a thousand. I'm like, we grow outdoor, it's not exclusive. Like, that's not me, but it didn't matter. Um, and we paid the fee. Um, I guess that question came in a lot, but otherwise, as far as permitting and licensing and everything, it's been very um, communicated clearly what the expectations are, the hemp rules, there were warnings of like hemp rules are changing, here's the date they change, here's what they are, we're offering 
maybe it was UVM, but somebody was breaking down from the hemp industry locally exactly what the rules are. Um, so I feel like everything's been really clear. I'm not sure about regulation, like number of plants, if it's hot, if it, you know, that kind of thing, how the agency of ag works, because I've never produced crops at a commercial level before. Um, but I would feel more than confident working with them. And um, like I know Scott's saying, sometimes it's just a lot of investment to take a risk on this business. But um, yeah. That, that's my experience with them. I would think they could oversee the permitting process without a doubt. And, and, and Rogers, would you have any concerns, uh, Senator and John F., would you guys have any, uh, uh, you know, um, hypothetical, theoretical concerns with moving in that direction? No, I've worked with the Ag Agency a lot in uh, drafting and working on the hemp legislation. Um, I think the only thing they need is the money uh because they would need a few more positions in the agency but cannabis is a plant the ag agency oversees plants in vermont they have the expertise they have the lab it, it seems like a no-brainer to me to put it there and one without, thing no one touched on i just want to bring up quickly is banking I, the safe banking act has to pass in some way or form because um, and for any of you who run online businesses, I'm sure you've been through credit card hell. Oh, yeah. well, I want to think one of our participants is Will Reed from Canna Planners, yeah. and he's helped me make the right decisions till we got with Square. Yeah. So you know, he's made it easy, some... but I couldn't agree with you more about the I... safe banking thing. I have um... Square health stories to tell you, <laughs> but I'm on... I've been open a little over two years and I'm on my fifth credit card processor. And um, just, you know, we have to go to a credit union that could go on, but I'm just saying that's a big part of this. And if we're going to go legal adult use cannabis, the banking part has to be solved. I agree completely. Uh, I, I heard uh, a quote from a famous uh, cannabis advocate not too long ago, and that generally is to paraphrase the more we treat this like a every other industry, the more we yes. normalize, the, yes. the, the less corruption, the less issues we, we may have. No mm -hmm. certainty here, but uh, just broadly speaking. And that's what, I, that's what, I, that's what I'm hearing from, uh, from you guys as well, uh, maybe in, in so many words. John, did you, wanna, did you wanna follow up with something? Yeah, so just to kind of circle back on something you said, um, that people Please do. have concerns about the Vermont agency of ag being able to take this over you know if they're qualified whatever um but without sounding too off the cuff i would i would ask them how they think a new organization committee board etc would be more qualified or how that would change I, I guess if you're not confident that the, the agency of ag that's established can do it then maybe they need training or you can add some positions to that to make them able to handle it. I don't see how creating a whole new board would eliminate the problem of somebody not being qualified to, to handle it. Um, Seems a little circular to me. Senator Rogers, uh, you, you mentioned that the Department of Ag would only need to hire a few more bodies um, to, to regulate the industry. Do you think those bodies would cost one circuit court judge salary plus four more salaries, two thirds of that value? Um, <laughs> state employees are expensive. Uh, by the time you do salaries and, and benefits and all that, I'm not exactly sure how many positions uh, they would need. I would need to discuss that with them, but I know it would be a few to, several positions probably so that's you know that's what that 175 grand or whatever that uh number is is supposed to go for is to get the program up and running um i think if you if you gave that money to the ag agency they could go out and hire the additional professionals that they need and they could have it up and running faster than any other agency or commission could have it up and running yeah. And I will add, in addition to that uh, uh, upfront fee that the state government would receive with that bill if it were to pass, 
that new agency, I believe, was quoted at about uh, one million annual for operating costs. So right. there's there's a there's a deficit there. Yeah. Um, fantastic. Uh, I, we are past eight. Um, I do uh, want to bring this to a, to a close uh, eventually. Uh, I don't want to take up too much time. Throughout the course of the evening, we've been fielding some questions. So thank you, VJ staff, for helping us. It's very much a community effort. Uh, and thank, thank you those that uh, uh, have been utilizing Zoom's uh, chat and question answer, question answer uh, features. Thank you guys for using them. Uh, we plan to be doing uh, a lot more of these in the future. Uh, this is hopefully just the beginning for us. Um, uh, I do want to say, um, you know, the purpose of this was not to uh, uh, demonize any particular piece of legislation. It was to have a thoughtful and insightful conversation uh, about craft cannabis in Vermont. Uh, that happens to include uh, the preeminent legislation. Uh, uh, and I thought that was helpful as context for all of us in, uh, in our various professions to offer some of your own uh, shared experiences and insight uh, into the conversation. Um, I do uh, want to close it at this time. I do want to let everyone know that we are planning the next uh, Craft First event already. It's underway. We're going to shift gears a little bit. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, breeding and genetics. Uh, we will be have, uh, we'll, we'll have some local uh, Vermont uh, cannabis breeders uh, and uh, professionals with us uh, in that roundtable discussion in the coming weeks. So those that are listening, uh, stay tuned for that. Uh, and those that have joined us, uh, thank you guys very much uh, for your time. Uh, I know that uh, I'm speaking for everyone at the Vermont Growers Association when I say that we are, not to be cl cliche, sincerely grateful and humbled for you guys uh, taking a chance with us and being our guinea pigs on this first uh, episode of Craft First. I really appreciate Thank you. it. Great I conversation. Add, yeah. Go ahead, I Brian. love seeing the businesses kind of uh, doing business with each other and meeting each other because as a trade organization, that's what we really want to do in the future is kind of support small businesses in helping each other and doing the things that they can't do alone like these corporations can, right? Yeah. So connecting extractors with yeah. processors, retailers with growers, and helping hope people find meet. jobs. Thank you. I hope to meet each one of you in person, and I support you in your work, and I'd love to know how I can do that further, and I'd like to welcome you anytime you're nearby, and maybe I'll stop by and say do you, hi to you guys when we're at Hill Farmstead next, All or right. near Kismet, or, or down in Brattleboro, or mm -hmm. um, uh, Underhill, maybe you said, somewhere, Jericho. Where are you, Greg? I'm in Bristol. Bristol. Cool. Yeah. Cool. yeah. Okay. Okay. Networking. Well, anyway, thanks for the opportunity. Thank yeah. you. Networking is super important. And it was great to uh, electronically meet all of you and look forward to meeting everybody in person. All right. Same here. Thanks. Thank for you. Thank you. Be safe. Take care. Thanks, everybody. Yes. Happy growing, guys. All right. See you guys.